reviewed all three of the Metroid Prime games now, several other Metroid games including Other M, and even Metroid Prime Pinball. This is probably a long time coming, but I think the time has finally come to review the one Metroid Prime game I have yet to review. That stars Samus Aran. Shoo, shoo, get out of here, you lousy spinoff. That's right, folks, it's time to go risk deep in bounty hunters and search for a mysterious power in the Olympic Cluster as I review Metroid Prime Hunters for the Nintendo DS. Metroid Prime Hunters, of course, follows in the same vein as the console Prime games, being an exploratory first-person shooter slash adventure game. There was actually a demo that came free with DS Fat System simply called Metroid Prime Hunters The First Hunt. You actually had three different types of stages in that one. One was simply a linear trek to the end with a dark clone of Samus, not to be confused with Dark Samus. The other two are a morph ball race and a marathon to see how long you can survive and rack up a score. Doing well enough in these unlocked a secret cutscene, teasing another bounty hunter Samus would have to face. Overall, it was a fun freebie demo, even if it was obviously less exploratory Metroidvania and more simple little chunks. The actual game itself, of course, has more exploratory focus and even includes a scan visor. You can also scan enemies and the like, just like on Console Prime, but you read the data on your ship rather than through a menu. You start out with prior equipment that includes the power beam, the charge beam, the missile launcher, the morph ball, the morph ball bomb, and the boost ball. You also have the super missile, but this time you just charge the missile launcher directly. Unlike other games, none of this equipment is lost or needs to be found at all. You also appear to start out in the various suit and you don't get any other suits in the game either. That being said, it does still have a Metroidvania progression of tools in the form of grabbing different beam weapons more or less made for this game that use the same universal ammo. The first of these is the Battle Hammer that can't be charged but is on auto-fire and acts like a grenade. The Judicator is essentially the ice beam that can be charged to fire a burst 3 shot. The Volt Driver fires electrical shots and its charge shot is a much bigger projectile. The shock coil is a bit more interesting, firing a constant burst of electricity but is limited in reach and can best be described as the lightning version of Prime 1's flamethrower. The magma beam is essentially a magma beam, but not like the plasma beam you may be used to. Rather, it fires a ball of the stuff in an arc like the battle hammer, but can be charged for a stronger shot. The Imperialist is by far the most unique, you can actually zoom with it and fire a laser beam like a friggin' sniper rifle. The penultimate weapon is the Omega Cannon, essentially Metroid's answer to the BFG that fires a very powerful blast radius shot and is required to harm the final boss. The game has a few enemy types, including reoccurring ones like Zoomers, Shriek Bats, and War Wasps. Some new enemies include the Slam and Crash Pillars, the very numerous Psycho Bits that fire various weapon types depending on which one, and Arctic and Lava Spawn that fire Ice and Fire respectively. Perhaps the signature enemy of the game is the Guardians, they're basically bipedal droids that fire beams at you. Not too bad, but they tend to attack in swarms. Of course, then there's the Bounty Hunters, which essentially serve as mini-bosses. They each have one of the elemental beams as their signature attack, but notable ones are Noxus, Weevil, and Trace. Noxus can freeze you, so be careful of his Judicator. Weevil can split himself in half with the upper half melee and the lower half a battle hammer turret. Thankfully, they share the same health bar, so feel free to attack whichever one you're more comfortable with. Trace actually turns invisible to snipe you with his Imperialist. Oddly though, despite having similar latching quadroids and similar design Petra seals, there's no Metroids in this game, like at all. In Metroid Other M and Metroid Fusion, where Metroids are supposed to be extinct, they have it, but this somehow doesn't. Making matters even more scrambled is that First Hunt had actual Metroids programmed in and they were removed from the final release, so it's not like it was a time thing. Yeah, try and figure that one out. Where the game really drops the ball, though, was the bosses. The Critifit is a large pillar that fires various things at you, you have to shoot all the eyes on it that can phase in and out of being shootable, after which a core pops out and you shoot that to damage it. Pretty simple, just keep up the pattern until it's dead and watch out for its attacks. The second boss is actually a little annoying, the Slinch. It's basically an eyeball you have to destroy the tentacles of. After that, its barrier is temporarily down and you can hurt it by firing directly on its pupil. This is harder than you may think because it's constantly moving around when it's vulnerable. Even more annoying is that it later on gains the ability to ram you randomly, which much like Ridley's charge attack in Prime 1 is hard to dodge. All I have to say is the shock coil is a freaking godsend once you get it because it locks onto him. He also gains the ability to roll around, but it isn't that hard to dodge and it's more or less just there to waste time. Just keep the pressure up until it's dead. Now you may be thinking that's not too bad. The Slinch may be a bit annoying to hit, but the console primes had their fair share of some annoying bosses too, and these are decently varied, so surely the rest of the bosses are better, right? Well, with the exception of the final boss, you're looking at all of them. This is no joke, you have to fight each boss four different times each, and the only change is some extra weapons and moves, like the aforementioned Roll and Ram from the Slinch. Given the game is full of FMV cutscenes, kinda wish they'd remove some of those and use the extra space to make more bosses. Then again, maybe the issue was time. It's pretty clear that the focus of the game was on the multiplayer, something you can't even do nowadays anyway since the servers are now down. 
In a similar fashion as the bosses, the four planets are also recycled at least once, and you have to revisit them. Kinda begs the question why each boss comes with an escape sequence since the planet is clearly fine afterwards. To be fair though, in the case of the planets, at least you're going to new areas that are mostly different. That really helps to make it feel less repetitive, especially since there are new concepts in the first sections for the most part. Thankfully though, the final boss named Goria actually is different. Well, new-ish, since it's basically just a rip-off of Metroid Prime anyway. The first stage has him shift which elemental attacks he uses, but in a twist is actually vulnerable to the previous form's element. I recommend to wait until he's vulnerable to the Imperialist and hit him with that, because when he exposes his core, that weapon will remain its one vulnerability. Being a highly focused sniper weapon, the Imperialist does a ton of damage to him. If you just kill him like that, the game ends on a cliffhanger, and it's vague if Samus ever got away. If you fire the artifacts across the walls in the right order corresponding with scans or Goria's own elemental pattern and then beat him, it's different. The artifacts fire some kind of wave into him to make his core vanish, then lock onto turrets and shoot him. This sends him flying off in flames as Samus is teleported to face round two. For some reason, the turrets firing on him cause his core to become integrated into him, and phase two is invincible to your weapons, but luckily you're informed of a new weapon below. All you have to do is drop to the bottom and you get the Omega Cannon. After that, you have to land hits on Goria with it. Thankfully, this OP weapon of destruction is infinite ammo, but is slow to fire. Goria will pelt shots at you and teleport around, but keep the pressure up until it's dead. The game also does have a light amount of puzzles here and there, with a the goal on each part being to grab three artifacts to open up a portal to each boss. There's an interesting part with switches that deactivate if you're too close and you have to Imperialist them. There's also some places where you have to use the Morph Ball, including a large room where you're under a sheet of ice and have to navigate through it. Of course, you also have upgrades for your ammo, missiles, and health to collect as always. Interestingly, one spot is you going through lava that deals constant damage and bombing launches you high up. It's the one time in the game this is a thing, and it's completely optional, so that's pretty neat. Naturally, like Prime, the scan visor is your friend if you need to activate something, or if you're just getting lost. It also has some areas with instant death pits, which I'm not so much a fan of. I'm guessing it's that way for multiplayer, but they should have programmed it to teleport you to the nearest ground with maybe a small health penalty like in the console Prime games. You have to collect crystals by beating each boss to get to Goria, but the twist is bounty hunters who kill you in random encounters can actually steal them from you. You can't get a permanent game over, though, so just hunt them down if they actually manage to steal any from you. With all the crystals, of course, you still have to take them to the right spot to reveal the final planet. One thing I do have to give the game credit for is the controls. I'm sure some will say the left hand on D-pad and L and the right hand on stylus isn't really comfortable to play, but I never really had any issues with it. It felt good enough to control, even emulated with keyboard and mouse, and it was intuitive enough to get the job done. Double tapping to jump was probably a nightmare on people's touchscreens, but at least swiping up to do a quick boost ball felt pretty natural. When you get down to it, Metroid Prime Hunters is the basic formula of a Metroid game, one could argue. It has some decent puzzles here and there, it has a good sense of atmosphere, you still progress through collecting new beams to open doors with, and it has some bosses and mini-bosses. The problem is that generally there's a lack of polish. It plays like multiplayer was an advertisement for the DS's Wi-Fi capabilities, and the story was just an afterthought. It's not terrible by any means, but the copy-paste bosses and over-reliance on the bounty hunters and a general lack of variety somewhat hurt the gameplay as a Metroid game. Believe it or not, there's actually a pretty decent story in this game. It's fairly shallow by Metroid standards, but it's more than you'd expect for a multiplayer-centric game, although some of it makes no sense. Essentially, a message is sent out promising ultimate power in the Olympic Cluster. Naturally, Samus Aran is sent there on behalf of the Galactic Federation to either secure it for them or to see it destroyed. The bounty hunters actually have their own motives, and despite all acting like enemies, not all of them are self-serving. Noxus is actually tasked with making sure this great power is kept out of the wrong hands. Can't imagine why he'd oppose Samus unless he views the Galactic Federation as the wrong hands. Likewise, Spire simply wants to use the power to try to find out what happened to his people. Trace is more neutral, a member of the Krykans, invaders of other worlds similarly to the Saiyans from Dragon Ball Z. If he can acquire the power, he'll be seen as a big hero by his people. While he's not a direct antagonist to Samus, he's probably a bad guy since they invade other worlds and would probably likely go after Earth or similar planets at some point. Candon is just straight up an evil Frankenstein's monster bug thing produced in a sinister laboratory somewhere. Given that his first act is to completely destroy the lab he was produced in, that tells you all you need to know. He's a pretty obvious bad guy, but he still has no personal ties to Samus. Silex and Weevil, on the other hand, would seem to be direct enemies of Samus for different reasons. Silex stole Galactic Federation prototypes, which would naturally make him an enemy of Samus too. Weevil, meanwhile, was a space pirate who ran into Samus and Zebus and was reduced to a brain and spine. He was kept alive by being transfixed into a cyborg body, which is why he can split himself in half. Like in Prime 1, the game actually explains the fate of the Olympic and lore scans. Goria proved unstoppable, so they sealed him up at the cost of their lives. One thing that's pretty silly is they had the Omega Cannon, but they chose not to use it, feeling it was abominable. 
Yep, the one thing they can kill him, they refused on principle. I can kind of see why they died out, as callous as that sounds. Essentially, the bosses and guardians of the Olympic wanting to ensure that nobody can ever get the necessary crystals to unseal the planet containing Goria. Why they didn't just bury the crystals somewhere is anyone's guess. Maybe they didn't trust that. Oh well, cheap gameplay excuses are cheap. When Samus arrives to Goria's chamber, she's treated to the other bounty hunters shooting Goria's seal. For their efforts, they're purged with Goria's tentacles and life essence is absorbed before being disposed of. This is seemingly why it has elemental attacks, because it absorbed it from the bounty hunters. When you beat its second form, contrary to the ambiguous neutral ending, it shows Samus getting away before the planet actually explodes. Interestingly, you can also see lights escaping from the planet, implying the bounty hunters got away. Samus is thanked in spirit, more or less, by the Olympic, and she flies off. A job well done. The assumption is that the Omega Cannon is now in possession of the Galactic Federation. It's possible that Samus kept it, but she never uses it again. As a plot, it's alright, even if it's shallow. Bounty hunters are alive, and there's a lot of potential for a Prime 4 to incorporate them, since Prime 3 seems to imply Silex's ship. I wouldn't mind seeing bounty hunters like Noxus and Spire team up with Samus while Weevil and Silex serve as primary antagonists. Maybe the others serving as bosses themselves, the sky's the limit in that regard. So yeah, the plot has potential, but it's still clearly a multiplayer-centric game, so it's lacking compared to what you would come to expect. Presentation was always a strong suit of the Metroid series, and Hunters is thankfully no exception for the most part. For being a DS game, it has some surprisingly good-looking graphics, and looking at it in HD isn't that bad. Seeing as how Metroid skipped the N64 generation, this may be the closest thing to that, although it exchanges texture filtering for having better graphics capacity. One thing I actually thought stood out not necessarily for the good is the FMV scenes. The opening is pretty neat, but aside from that, I think they could have done without and tried to use in-game cutscenes instead. The FMVs are not only heavily compressed to fit on the cartridge, but it feels jarring going from high-detailed models to the DS's vastly lower-res counterparts. Fortunately, there's a decent amount of environmental variety, too. Celestial Archive seems to be a space base, presumably for archiving as the name suggests. The second half includes what looks like a base of some sort, followed by teleporter-type puzzles and then assorted mess of fragments. Presumably it's in tatters and you have to go across instant death pits of space. Alinos is primarily a thermal power plant, with the second half being more of a sand desert kind of environment. The major highlights are an extensive jump pad puzzle and a sort of morph ball obstacle course with pistons, railings, and lava falls. Notably, Alinos also has the cannon control room where you have to take the crystals to in order to unlock the final world. The Vesper Defense Outpost is an iced outpost. You'll be seeing a lot of iced over industrial areas, in other words. The second half actually consists largely of the level design from First Hunt's morph ball race mode, so that's pretty neat. There's also a tall room at some point that you have to race to the top of to abort a shutdown sequence. Naturally, Arctera is the snow world full of ice and snow. At one point, you have to deal with war wasps along the wirings of a barrier to get it to drop, which is aesthetically kind of cool, pun intended. The second half consists largely of frost labyrinths with imperialist beam puzzles and probably the one section of the game where in console prime fashion you have to use a missile to knock over a pillar. It also has an underground rail shooter section, so that's pretty interesting. Oubliette is the interdimensional prison that Goria is locked in. There aren't really any puzzles, just an energy tank you can morph ball tunnel into to nab. It has an alright alien look to it, but it's mostly just a means to an end. From there, it's a straightforward path to Goria, where it's a large arena with a force field ring around the outer half that you have to jump over to distance yourself from him. Goria's second phase is in a large rocky structure that you have to navigate up and down on, nothing too special. As you may expect, chunks of each world are also used as multiplayer levels for what it's worth. The music is also fine, nothing ground shaking, but it gets the job done. Second Phase Goria actually uses Second Phase Metroid Prime's theme, so that's pretty neat. Given all the similarities both in first form and second form to Metroid Prime, this was probably intentional. Overall, the game looks quite good from a presentation standpoint. When you understand the limits of the system it's on, and it doesn't sound half bad either. The problem is that they were clearly put on a restricted budget and time frame, and it really shows. You'll see a lot of repetition, both in terms of gameplay and to a lesser extent visually. Still, what's there is surprisingly polished, and I'd say it still looks and sounds quite good, all things considered. My thoughts on Prime Hunter as a whole are definitely very mixed, to say the least. On the one hand, there's a good amount of polish and the game plays well enough, so I don't think they were necessarily being lazy. On the other hand, though, the single player starts getting repetitive and it's clear that the multiplayer was the main focus. Would I recommend Metroid Prime Hunters? That kind of depends on how much you love the Prime series. Nowadays, I'd say probably not, unless you have a DS or 3DS and really want a Prime experience on the go, or you're just curious and already played the three main Prime games. 
Just bear in mind that you're getting a cheaper experience of a game that already existed prior to it, and the servers are shut down, so no multiplayer either. In short, I think Prime Hunters' best contributions are being a pretty good DS game and having some ideas that could have a lot of potential for future games. Hey, at least it isn't Federation Force. And with that, I've reviewed every last Metroid Prime game, asterisk that stars Samus in it. Maybe I'll get to Federation Force one day, but for now, that's my review. Thank you so much for tuning in with me, and I'll see you next time, future bounty hunter.